Well, Christmas is coming. You cannot speed it up. You cannot slow it down. And you may or may not have ever thought about this, but did you know, did you know, Christmas has a sound. And, and I'm not talking about Christmas music, and this has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but just out of curiosity, how many of you are can't start Christmas music early enough people? Raise your hand. Let me see. All right. How many of you are maybe on the 24th, like it'd be okay to have Christmas music? <laughs> All right, some of you are lying and some of you aren't voting. You know, kind of half raised over there, like, maybe, maybe, yeah, 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 yeah. No, Christmas actually has a sound. And, and, and I want to talk to you about that because I know it sounds a little funny to hear that Christmas has a sound. But, but what's behind Christmas is a couple of really important ideas. Uh, hope is behind Christmas. Peace is behind Christmas. Love is behind Christmas. Joy is behind Christmas. And all of those things have a sound. And if you say, well, what does it sound like? I got to be honest, I can't tell you exactly. But I can tell you this, you know it when you hear it. And, and the reason that's true is because the opposite is true as well. When you hear division and anger and hate and fighting, you know it when you hear it, don't you? I mean, it, it, what is the sound of it? I don't know exactly how to describe it, but I know it when I hear it. And what we're talking about today is hope. And hope absolutely has a sound. And I'm going to prove it to you. Uh, and we're going to play a little game here. And for bonus points, if you can name the movie uh, when you hear the sound, you get bonus points. But, but. Almost all of us have found ourselves in a situation where we're kind of looking at something in front of us. It's coming up in our life. We, we know we're going to have to deal with this thing, and it is a little bit overwhelming, and it looks like it's going to be a lot of work, and it's going to be really hard. And if you hear something like this, it's going to motivate you to do nothing. There it is. <laughs> ah, Rocky, yeah, you kind of get your workout on. You get a little encouraged, you know fight whatever you got to fight. Yeah, so Rocky, sometimes you hear that and it gives you a little bit of hope, okay? Other things, other things you may be facing. Something hard and something with a lot riding on it where if it went one way, it could be really good. But if it went the other way, it could be really bad. So it's kind of exciting. It's kind of scary. It's kind of like an adventure. And when you hear something like this, Indiana Jones. Yeah, it gives you a little... All right, maybe we can do that. We just got to get a fedora and we can do this, right? I mean, we, we can make it happen. The other situation, and unfortunately it's the one that is way too common, is that feeling of the bad guys are winning. Like, and maybe you're in a place in your life where it just feels like, man, the bad guys are winning and, and it's, you know, I know good is supposed to win, but it feels like it's not. And, and, and you need a little encouragement and you hear something like this. Star Wars, right? We, we, we kind of, that reminds us that good wins, good beats evil, and, and that excites us. Those kinds of things, and I know those are silly examples of movie titles or whatever, but just hearing things sometimes can change our mood and give us a sense of hope. But to be honest, it's hope that's based on a feeling. And so I kind of did a little survey work on my own to see what do people think about hope? What do people say about hope? And I went to Reddit. If you know what it is, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you don't, you don't need to bother with it. It's, it's not a great place. But, but uh, on Reddit, they talk about hope. And I searched hope. And one of the things I came across was uh, people's thoughts, people's opinions when it came to hope. And one guy said, I hope for less. I've decided not to hope anymore, he went on to say. And then he said, which I thought was really, really sad. He goes, I've decided that hope is a wicked thing. And I thought, ah, oh. I, I, mean, I just felt for the guy. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's happening in your life. But if you're at that point where that's the way you're thinking, things aren't going well, you know? And then I came across another one, a little more positive. He said, hope is the fuel of human existence. And I thought, okay, maybe, you know, and, and he went on to write, you know, if you have hope, you have happiness. He says, if you have hope, everything is good. And then he put this little, little, little phrase at the end of it though. He goes, but I have to confess, I have no idea where hope comes from. And so I thought, oh, you know, here's a guy that he's kind of getting it. He's understanding that hope is really important, but he has no idea where it comes from or how to get it or what to do about it. He just knows that he needs it. And I thought, boy, I, I, there's a lot of people that have either given up or people that know it's important, but don't know how to get it. And unfortunately, most of us, and maybe you, have experienced false hopes or even worse, even a little more dramatic, crushed hopes. That, that we wanted this great life. And we knew it was out there. And, and, and for, for today's purposes, when we're going to talk about hope, we're going to talk about hope as the life that God created you to live. And it is a good life, and it is a great life, and God created you to live. It's your best life, and we all want that, and you should want that. But for so many, it just feels too far away. It's not going to happen. 
It's not going to work out. It didn't work out. I tried and, and, and I worked at it and I did some stuff and it just, I, I've kind of given up because it didn't seem to happen for me. And what we do, at least what a lot of people do, maybe you haven't, but what a lot of people do that end up discouraged is they put their hope in things and those things fell through. So give me an example. For some people, the idea is, I want this great life. So I'm going to get a good education. I'm going to get a great job. I'm going to make a lot of money. And then I'm going to have my great life. It doesn't usually work. Some people kind of take it and make it a little more personal. I'm going to find the right boyfriend. And I'm going to have the best relationship. And we're going to get married. And then I'm going to have a great life. Not always. Others kind of take, take control and, like, you know, I've got the good job and so I'm going to work hard. I'm going to apply myself. I'm going to chase my passions and my dreams and I'm going to excel and I'm going to outperform and I'm going to get promoted and I'm going to get to the top. And when I get to the top and I get to be the one in charge, then I'm going to have a great life. And we put hope in the wrong things and then we give up on hope when it doesn't come through. And that happens for so many people. That, that's just a regular thing. And it's, it's a common mistake. It's an easy mistake to make. It's a mistake I've made. Maybe it's a mistake you have made where you put your hope in something and it didn't work out. And then it just felt crushing. It was discouraging or maybe even worse. It did work out and you got the money and you got the marriage and you got the promotion and you look around and you go, oh, I still don't have the great life. What happened? What, how, how did I end up? I, I did all the things I was supposed to get. I mean, this was supposed to give me the great life. I put up my hope in this. And even though I accomplished everything, it didn't happen. Now what? And it's just such a hard place to be. And Jesus speaks into that. Jesus speaks into that. And, 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 and what he does is he tells us there is hope, but it's not in things. It, it's not in the stuff that you do. He makes a big, bold statement, and we're going to look at it here in just a minute, but, but he basically says that hope is knowing God keeps his promises. Hope is knowing that God keeps his promises, and the biggest promise God has made you, like if you stacked them all up and you said, which is the most important, which is the biggest promise that God ever made, the biggest, most important promise that God has made to you is that you can live the life he created you to live by following Jesus. He gives you that promise and he gives you a way to get there. And it's hope, not based on things, not based on what I do, not based on what happens to me, but hope based on the one who gives me life to bring me the life I've been after the whole time. You see, knowing Jesus is knowing hope. And again, if you're a skeptic and you hear that and you think, oh, come on, that, that's too easy, that doesn't really make sense. I, I'm asking you, give me a few minutes because let's look at how this really breaks down because Jesus does something that a lot of people don't. Jesus acknowledges. He goes, hey, there's a lot of people. Everybody's looking for hope. There's a few people that find it, and there's a lot of people that get crushed by it or give up on it. And he talks about this in John chapter 10. If you want to, we're going to read from there in just a second. In John chapter 10, Jesus talks about what hope really looks like and how you get it and how you avoid the false hopes and the crushed hopes that so many people are so familiar with. But as we dive into this, you need to know something. Jesus does something kind of odd. And it doesn't sound odd to us looking back because we know the Christmas story and we know about shepherds and sheep and all this other stuff. But you got to put yourself in that moment. It was actually a really weird thing to say. Jesus compares himself to a shepherd in John chapter 10. And you hear that and you might think, well, what difference does that make? In his day and time, most shepherds were considered to be untrustworthy. Uh, they were a little bit shady. You didn't know they might steal from you. They lived outdoors. They didn't really belong anywhere. They traveled and roamed around. They didn't really have a home. Uh, they were people that other people were always a little bit on guard about. Like, eh, I'm not sure if I see one of these guys that I really trust them. I don't want to turn my back on them. I don't want to, you know, I got to watch my stuff because they might take it. And, and so shepherds had a bad reputation. And so in one sense, it seems weird. Jesus, are you comparing yourself to these guys? Are you saying that we shouldn't trust you and that you're a little shifty and all this other stuff? That doesn't seem right. But there was one other ironic way that people talked about shepherds, which again, it seems strange to us. But in that day and time, if they had a really good king or a really good leader, somebody that, that really took care of the people, it wasn't all about them. They, they really took seriously the people that they were responsible for. They called that good king or that good ruler a shepherd. A good shepherd, because ultimately a shepherd's job was quite simple. They were supposed to protect the sheep, provide for the sheep, look out for the sheep. And so they took that and they applied it to the ruler. And they said, a good ruler is like a good shepherd. They protect their people. 
They provide for their people. They look out for their people. And so Jesus, are, are you saying that you're like a king, a ruler? Because again, if you were there and you heard this, you'd kind of look around and go like, well, where's your throne, bro? I mean, you're just, you're just kind of wandering around with a bunch of guys and you're claiming to be a king? That doesn't really sound right. But Jesus, like he always did, he kind of even won up that. He didn't claim to be a good shepherd, which they would have heard as a good ruler. He claimed to be the good shepherd, like above all the other ones. And while it might not have gotten your attention, I guarantee you, if you were in the crowd that day, that would have gotten your attention. Wait a minute. Did you just say that you are the best ruler, the best king, the one out of all the hundreds and thousands of history and kings and rulers that we've had? You're the best one. Is that what you're saying? So when Jesus said he was a good shepherd, he was actually saying something pretty important. So let's look at John chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, because Jesus is actually talking to a large crowd of people, but he, but he specifically addresses a group within that crowd. John chapter 10, verse 1. He says, Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, that anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Now stop there for a second. I know that's a lot of stuff about sheep and shepherds. And unless you did that for a living, it kind of can be a little confusing. And so I want to break this down for just a second. Jesus says the shepherds use a pen. And I, you know, we don't have pictures, but it might have looked something like this. This was like a sheep pen that you would see out in the countryside where Jesus lived. And they were community, like anybody could use them. If it was empty and you had some sheep, you could put them in that pen. Everybody used them. The pens were important. At night, they wanted to keep the sheep together. They didn't want them wandering off because then that meant they had to go look for them. At night, they wanted to keep them together and keep them fenced in because the, the enemies of the sheep, animals that might eat them or attack them, would kind of have to keep out because of the fence. So the pens were very important and they belonged to no one, but they were used by everyone. And Jesus said something very interesting. He said, not everybody who comes to the sheep pen has good intentions. Now, hopefully, and I'm sure you caught this by now, Jesus didn't talk about sheep, okay? He's talking about people, right? He's the shepherd, we are the sheep. And he's saying that not everybody that comes to the sheep pen cares about you wants the best for you. As a matter of fact, you have an enemy that's often working against you. And he goes on to say later in this passage that everybody else that comes to this sheep pen comes for three reasons. To steal, to kill, and destroy. And while that could look like a lot of different things, I wanna, for today anyway, I wanna ask you to think about that in terms of false hopes. False hopes, like we just talked about. Those false hopes that promise you this great life, the life you've always wanted to live, the life you've been chasing and hoping for and wanting that turns out to not happen because it's based on a thing. It's false. It's fake. It's failed. And it happens in a couple of ways. It happens really two ways, two main ways that this happens to all of us. Some people take the very passive approach. Like, I am just going to (laughs) wait. I'm going to wait for this great life to come and find me. You know, things always work out for me. I'm sure it'll happen. It's out there. And I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait for this life to magically find me and make my life better. The the life I really want is somehow, some way, cross my fingers, cross my heart. It'll show up and everything will be great. Except it doesn't. And that's frustrating. And if that's the approach you've taken, it's so easy to get discouraged, to kind of want to just give up to be depressed, to feel like it's never gonna happen and lose hope. And that is the path that some people take. But most people, most people take the other path. The other path is much more active, much more energetic, much more take control. And it says that I am, I am putting my faith in the fact that if I work hard enough 
at my family, at my education, at my work, at my finances, at my passions, at the drives that I have. If I will work hard enough and grind hard enough and long enough, and if I will really put in my best, then I will get that great life. And once I get to the top of the mountain, then, whew, it's going to be so good. Just got to keep climbing. I'm going to get there. Except for most of us, somewhere along the climb, we get to something we can't climb over. We don't control our health. We don't control our relationships. Company changes their focus and direction. Things happen. And all that stuff that I worked so hard at and that I built everything on and I was so sure it was gonna give me the life that I was after <sighs> falls apart. Or, this is a little more rare, you actually get all the stuff. <laughs> you actually do it. You pull it off. And you're looking around and you're going, man, I live in this fat house. I got a big bank account. My family's great. Everything's wonderful. I mean, this is everything I've been working for. This is everything I've planned on. And I still don't have a great life. I did all the stuff. I checked all the boxes. I'm rich. I'm famous. I'm beautiful. I'm whatever. I did all the things. But I don't have the life that I know. I'm supposed to have. I don't have the life that I was created to live. And that's what false hopes do. False hopes steal, kill, and destroy. And whether it's because we chased them and ran into a hurdle, or we waited for them and they never showed up, or we ran after them all and we accomplished everything, but we still don't have it, we hate, we hate looking at crushed hopes. It's too harsh. We can't do it. And so what we do is we decide we got to distract ourselves. we got to find a way to not deal with that, not think about that. And so we eat too much, we drink too much, we smoke too much, we get distracted with screens too much. We just find too many ways to distract ourselves so I don't have to think about the fact that the hopes that I have aren't happening right. Or the really ambitious decide to run up the mountain one more time. I'm going to try it with a new set of relationships. I'm going to try it with a new identity. I'm going to try it with a whole new approach and a different philosophy. I'm going to go after different things. And sooner or later, then I'm going to get there. And the exact same thing happens over again. See, false hopes, they promise life. They absolutely promise you that you will have life, but they leave you with loss. It doesn't happen and it doesn't work. And Jesus says, oh, oh he says it doesn't have to be that way. And he makes it so, so personal. He says, this isn't something for everybody. This isn't something for the crowd. This is something for you. Between me and you, I can give you the hope. I can give you the life that you've always wanted, that you've always chased, that you've been waiting on. I can give you that. And he uses this crazy metaphor of a shepherd calling his sheep by name. And I thought to myself, I've never seen that. <laughs> I don't know what that looks like. And, you know, for some of you, I know it's a shock. YouTube wasn't around in 28 AD, and so we don't have any videos of this. But we do have a modern video that I want to show you. What does it mean? What does this mean? He's calling his sheep. What does that even look like? Take a look. This happened somewhere in probably Scotland or England uh, on rolling grassy hills in a misty fog bank where the shepherd can't even see the sheep. And watch how he calls them in. I love it. He calls them and he doesn't give up on them. Like the eager overachievers, they come right away, right? You know what I mean? And then the, then the big group comes and then the last ones are kind of like, I, I, she, what are we doing out here? I don't know. You know, the ones that are like late to the party, they show up too. And he doesn't give up because he knows how many are coming. He knows 
their names. He calls them in. And I don't know if it was exactly like this, but when Jesus says the shepherd knows the sheep by name, he's calling them. He's calling us. He's saying, come, come on, come on, I, I got something for you. That life that you've been waiting for, that you've been looking for, that you have been trying to accomplish, that you have been grinding for, I, I've got it. I've got that life, the one you were created to live, and I want to give it to you, so just come on in. Just come on in. And he knows your name. It's not a general appeal to just, hey, anybody and everybody. I mean, it is available to everyone, but he doesn't leave it at that. It becomes so very personal. He calls you to come. And when you hear that, and I'm sure for those sheep, they came, they were excited. It wasn't drudgery. They weren't mad. They, they were excited to come back and gather together with the rest of the flock and be with the shepherd. And when you hear that, even if you're a little bit of a skeptic, you might think to yourself, there is some hope in that. I mean, put aside everything for just a second. That God would call me in, that he knows my name, that he wants me to come. That's, that's pretty cool. That, that gives me a sense of excitement and a sense of, of hope. And I know hope is more than a feeling, but, but it makes me feel hopeful. But yet, it's still a little foggy. Like, what exactly does that, how does that work? What does that mean? What does, it, what does that look like? And if that's where you're at, you're in good company. <laughs> because Jesus' followers that were sitting right there with him felt the exact same way. Like, we like what you're saying. We don't really know exactly what you mean, but we love what you're saying. And so he makes it plain. In John 10, if you slide down to verse 14, he wants there to be no mistake. He says, I am the good shepherd. So we know who he is. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I have known the father, just so close, we're so close to each other, just that same way I know my sheep, the same way I know the father. And I lay my life down for my sheep. I mean, he leaves no question. Why is he the good shepherd? Why is he a source of hope? Because he lays his life down for you to have life. I mean, it becomes this incredible thing that it's not based on a thing that I do. It's not based on me being in the right place at the right time. It's not based on some magical uh, formula that I've got to figure out and turn the dials just right and then I can have the life. It's not based on any of that stuff. And it's not just a feeling. It's a reality that God has kept his promise that this good shepherd knows my name and he has called me to himself. And when I think about that, it gives me hope. But I also recognize <laughs> that even if you know all that, sometimes it's hard to be hopeful. Sometimes you look around at the world around you and maybe it's something that you've done and you're kind of paying for it and you don't feel like you had a lot of hope. Or maybe it's something that didn't have anything to do with you. It's what somebody else did to you. It wasn't your fault. You didn't make any mistake. You didn't do anything wrong. But it's hard to have a lot of hope. Some of you, maybe in your approach to God and the way you think about spirituality and the way you think about those kind of things, you feel like, I'm, I'm not against God. I, I just, that, it's not really part of my life. I don't really do the God thing. And I'm not even sure, even if it, it did believe it, even if it was true, I, what it really comes down to for all of us is, <laughs> we're asking a question underneath all those things. Our circumstances, the things that happen to us, our own doubts, our own concerns. There's really one small, small question underneath all of that. Would he still call my name? I know he calls everybody else. I know the people that have life figured out and it seems like it's going great and everything goes great for them. I know he called their name. I know the people that somehow seem to have this incredible strength and they go through all this stuff and it doesn't seem to phase them. I know, I know he's called their name. Is, is he still calling my name? I'm kind of wondering if he's still calling my name because of what's happened, because of what I've done, because of my approach, because of this, because of that. Does he still call me? I gotta be honest with you, I, I struggle sometimes with hope. Sometimes I feel like my circumstances have kind of overwhelmed this. Even though I know it's true in my head, I don't always feel it in my heart. And, and here's what I do, and maybe this will be helpful to you. I always go back to Isaiah 
I've, I've memorized it because it has become so impactful and so important to me in building hope. And I want to share this passage with you because I think it might be something that could actually build your hope as well. And it's very simple. It's, it's very straightforward. It's, it's as, as, as singular a thought as you can get. It says, but now this is what the Lord says. He who formed you, Jacob, and he who created you, Israel. He's talking about identity. I made you. Nobody knows you better than me. I created you. I formed you. Do not fear. For I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. I think these last three words are so powerful. You are mine. (laughs) Put aside all the stuff for just a second. This is so personal. He's looking at you. He's not looking at everybody else in the room. He's looking at you. He said, I made you. I formed you. There's nobody nobody more invested than you than I am. And you can put your fear down. Anxiety, your fear, your depression, your discouragement, whatever you want to call it, you can put that down and you can replace it with hope for one simple reason. I redeemed you. I bought you back. I gave up my life so that you could have life. That's how intensely he loves you. And and if you're still not convinced, (laughs) he says, oh, I know your name. I treasure you. You you belong to me. You, You can not only have the life that you were created to live, I'm doing everything I can to help you live the life that I created you to live. That's how deeply personal, how how indestructible this is. This isn't based again in something that I do. And so you can, you can live in a hopeless stupor because you've been waiting and it never showed up. You can have an anxiety rich life because you're constantly grabbing and trying and climbing and hoping and and working to get it. You can look back as an adult and look at your faith as a child when your parents used to bring you to church and feel like, well, that was just an antique thing uh, from my childhood. It's not really important anymore. I have a very simple question. Why? Why would you do that? The good shepherd, he's calling you. And he's not just calling, hey, you. He knows your name. He's redeemed you. I mean, false hopes are so cruel and vicious. They crush us. But real hope, it is absolutely breathtaking that he would, that he has done, that he loves, that he includes, that he invites, that he knows. It's just extraordinary. Why? Why would we do anything else? And you might say, how how can you be so confident? (laughs) Well, see, there's something behind hope. It's either a wish, cross your fingers, (laughs) hope it works out, I'm wishing, or there's a certainty. I haven't seen it yet, but I know it's going to happen. See, those are two different things. And, And it's because of the cause. That's why you can be confident. The cause of your confidence really is what determines if your hope is a wish or a certainty. What is causing this confidence that you have? If it's your efforts and being in the right place at the right time and all the things we've really talked about, that's a wish, If it's because of God keeping a promise and a shepherd laying down his life and calling me by name to include me, that is a certainty. And I can't speak for everybody else. But for me, my hope is sure. My hope is confident because the good shepherd called Brett by name. He knows Brett. He's invited Brett to walk with him, to follow him. He has redeemed Brett. Before I ever knew I needed to be redeemed, I didn't even have to ask. He did it before I knew I needed it. He said, Brett, you're mine. That's why I have a confident hope and you can have the exact same confidence. That's what real hope looks like. And so I wanna leave you with three questions, three things. You gotta wrestle to the ground. These three ideas, these three questions, you've got to answer and I hope that you'll work on them even as we speak and, and, and throughout the day, that you gotta come up with the answer to these three simple questions. And the first one is this, do you know hope? <laughs> do you know hope? Jesus knows you, that's not the problem. <laughs> he knows all about you, probably more than you want him to know, right? I mean, he knows you. 
question is, do you know him? And I don't mean, do you know him like, yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah, he's a good guy. I've, you know, I've seen the stuff. He's on the cross, I, you know, born in the manger. I get it. I know him. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not asking if you know about him. Do you know him? Because that's very different. He knows you. Do you know him? It is so, so personal. It's supposed to be. Because he created you. He formed you. And he has an incredible life for you to live. And he knows you. Do you know hope? So that's the first question. Second question. Do you live hope? You might say, yes, I, I've answered that first question. I do know him. I, I, I know him. I walk with him. I, I, yeah. But, but do you live hope? See, it's easy to be hopeful on Sunday. It's easy when things are going well. It's easy when you're at a high point and you feel like God's with me and things are good. And, and, and yes, I know and love and trust Jesus. But, but when things aren't going well, when it's not Sunday, when it's Monday through Saturday and stuff's not working and relationships are breaking and, and things are, are, are going haywire, do you live hope? You know this, you've been around long enough. Governments are going to fail you. Society is going to twist and, 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 and contort things. People are going to destroy the image of God that he placed in their lives. Illnesses are going to come. Jobs are going to be lost. All kinds of things are going to happen. But really, what's behind this question, do you live hope, is are you confident? Are you convinced? Do you live out of the truth that God keeps his promises and Jesus knows your name? That's how you live hope. It's an important question. Do you live hope, not just in the moment, but on the regular? Last question, last question. Do you vibe hope? <laughs> Do you vibe hope? What is it that people get coming from you? Because all of us give off something, right? Are you the person that gives off hope? Is your life an outpost of hope in a sea of hopeless people? <laughs> they see, wait a minute, we're, you're going through the same stuff we're going through, but, but you're handling it different. You, you have a different attitude. You, you have a different mindset. You're, you're not doing and acting the way everybody else is acting. You, you're giving off something that's different because you're a representative of Christ. Because not only does he know you, but you know him. And it's changed because you're living the life he created you to live. Hope shows up and shows out because you can't hide it. So do you vibe hope? <laughs> As followers of Jesus... This is who we are. We're confident, but we're not cocky. We're, we're, we're sure, but we're not self-centered. And it's because we know the sound of hope. It is the sound of the good shepherd calling our name and reminding us, I've redeemed you and you belong to me. Let's pray together. Father God, astounding, amazing, so much hope, so different of a life, and you make it so easily available. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for allowing us to see him, to hear him, and to not just know about him, but to know him and trust him and follow him. Father, it invibes our hearts with hope. It changes our life. And God, we are so very thankful. And Father, for those that don't know hope today, I pray that you would put that question in their hearts and minds if they know hope and that you would speak to them and help them to see there is an answer to that question. And for the rest of us that know hope, Father, help us to live it and to give it off. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.